Hello, hello. Um, good evening. I'm Martin Eriksson, and I work at um, a little outfit called White Wolf. We do games about monsters. Um, and uh, some of you may have caught the Talk of Darkness uh, just recently, where I just, uh, had some of my wonderful colleagues in the world of darkness speaking about their projects and approaches and so on. One of the things that was prominently mentioned there it was, uh, is the size and scope of the world of darkness, not only when it comes to number of pages. <laughs> the 850 plus books book catalog is uh, enough to sink a medium transport car. Um, so, but also in the breadth of ways to play World of Darkness. It is for many people an emotional experience uh, and something that changes you a lot, encountering this world of monsters hidden among us for the first time. And that gives strong emotional connections to different styles of play. And as World of Darkness has now moved across the ocean, um, partially. It, we are coordinating the creative vision and the different individual projects of the world uh, from Stockholm, Sweden. As that movement has happened, we're also looking to coordinate and create um, several games that are set in a common shared universe. And with that comes, of course, the problem that has to be answered a burning question in everyone's mind. What is the right way to play World of Darkness? <sighs> so, I will go through a couple of, um, uh, a number of different ways, uh, talk about them a little bit. Hopefully you will recognize yourself in one of these, and you can cheer for it and hope that that is the tonality that will be the official one. <laughs> So yeah, without further ado, let's go to maybe the absolutely most classical one. Oh, the horror, oh, the beast within. This is in many ways the default for first edition vampire. It is um, not something that is heavily supported in later editions, where it moves to more of a conspiratorial um, and backstabbing intrigue game. But harken back to the olden days of, uh, uh, of the 90s and to the core of being the vampire. There is the mechanic of humanity, of frenzy and so on, and the drinking of blood. And the steady deterioration of, of humanity is a very, very strong factor in um, uh, not only in vampire, but in all of the World of Darkness games have some sort of degeneration mechanic. The overbearing rage of uh, the werewolf that threatens to, uh, to hurt their loved ones in um, uh, the course of the great struggle. It also, um, the struggle with paradox or trying to force your worldview upon others in mage, these are all core problems that leads to long nights of introspection and standing on rooftops and going, oh. It is also Wraith's default playstyle, and if you look at all of the games and their mechanics, possibly Wraith is the only game that really leans into that with the concept of shadow play, where the player to your left plays your dark side and tries to tempt you into terrible deeds. So this is, of course, the correct way to play World of Darkness. Uh, no other game has made more for freeform or for uh, live action, and the entire tradition of Finnish LARPers hiding in the closet, immersing in anguish, comes from this. So of course, oh the horror, oh the beast within, is the right way. Or is it? <laughs> Those man's namby-pamby depressed people, what do they really know about darkness? I belong to the rain-soaked streets of the urban nightmare. On my back are two silver-plated katanas, and uh, my memory runs back ages, uh, ages of bloodshed and fighting. The trench coats and katanas combat-heavy style has many uh, similarities to, to great movies like The Crow, Blade, and so on. Action-packed, 
dark, set in a brutal depiction of our contemporary urban uh, landscape that has a kind of a cyberpunky feel to it. Um, it is a wonderful way of using all the powers in the game. Uh, it is the way, more or less, to play um, games like uh, Hunter, The Reckoning, is best played this way. That's straight up a game of kicking these depressed monsters in the face. Uh, and, but it's also, it's not superheroes. I mean, this is Blade, not Avengers. It's like, it has, you're still vulnerable. You're still uh, a, a faction in the city of nightmarish creatures. And you can take your sides, like you are an urban ronin fighting for one of these powers. So it is apparent from the way that the rules are designed, all of the art that you see in the books, and all of the great movies that have been inspired by it, that trench coats and katanas is the only right way to play World of Darkness. But that forgets the very essence of vampires. Because what are vampires if not creatures of endless intrigue and complicated social relationships. Spending eternity with a bunch of 40 to 50 people will lead to, let's say, problematic interpersonal relations. <laughs> and that is what this style explores. It's, of course, most popular in its LARP format. It might also be, LARP might also be the absolutely right way to play World of Darkness. Because this style, if you do this around the, uh, the table, you can do it with relationship charts and a really good GM that can pretend like 40 different voices of all these people that you're having intrigues with. Clear relationship charts, the, the coterie and relationship charts in the early vampire books pioneered a social way of playing role-playing games. All games before this, were adventure stories. And now you say, oh, what about Call of Cthulhu and so on? I would say it goes for them as well. You go somewhere, you solve a mystery, you kill a dragon, and you gain something, or not lose your mind, or at least you kill the cultists, or whatever. It is a, it, those are adventure stories. Vampire the Masquerade is the absolutely first game that represents the social story, the soap opera if you want, or blood opera. And there's nothing wrong with soap operas. Game of Thrones is a great soap opera. Uh, Shakespeare's plays are great soap operas. And Vampire the Masquerade should absolutely be played in this way, and it goes for a lot of the other games as well. The politics of a cairn, uh, the, uh, the different ideological debates between tradition mages, they are absolutely best done as live action role playing, and as a blood soap that never ends with your friends. That is the one true way of playing World of Darkness. And um, if you don't believe me, uh, there's, this is easily the one that has the numbers on its side. We must also say that there are different ways of playing Days of Our Own Lives. There are those that enjoy the mechanically heavy emulation of social relationships that is in Mind's Eye Theater. Uh, in Europe, there have been many hacks and rewrites of this to go to the core of more, yeah, uh, more um, immersive social relations and so on. But whether you play it driven by heavy mechanics or in the way of uh, the end of the line or Convention of Thorns, which is explicitly one of these soap games, and I hope that the European Parliament will see its fair share of, of uh, backstabbing and personal hatreds as well. So whether th th these, all of these games are united by that they are the unique way of playing World of Darkness as a social game. Uh, and that is really what has broadened the appeal more than any of these other playing styles. But you know what? They will all wash away in front of the majesty of the dark superheroes of the night. <laughs> because why else would you have a scale that goes up to 10 dots for disciplines if you're not going <laughs> to use it? Or for spheres and so on. 
come on. This, uh, this is very much something that is represented in um, some of the revised versions of the game. Um, in, I think, second edition Mage has a strong feeling of this. Revised Vampire definitely has allowances uh, for these things. And before you say, like, no, that's just Batman with fangs and so on, it's like, think about it. These, these are superheroes that are in our own world. They don't exist in a parallel Gotham City and so on. They can interact with the real world politics, change the fate of nations behind the scenes, become the real Illuminati, or uh, defeat ancient gods that existed since before mankind. But they also have the hunger for blood, the threat of paradox and rage. That means that in best case, these dark superheroes of the night can tell us as, they can be as sophisticated stories as other dark superhero stories that comment on the price of heroics, uh, on, on absolute conviction. They can be as sophisticated as the graphic novel Watchmen, for instance. So don't poo-poo on the dark superheroes of the night, because it is the one true, most high-powered, most high-concept way of playing World of Darkness. You, you, there is a lot of support for this game style in a lot of the books, and I think it's, it's worth, absolutely worth not forgetting. That's the true way. But. <laughs> Dark, you say? Hmm, really. <laughs> <clears throat> I have a Fomori from <laughs> Freak Legion, who begs to differ. <laughs> Every single game has a splat that is built for transgressive play. The Nefandi, the Sabbat, the Spectres, the Ancili Satyrs, what have you. There is, off, there is support for making, turning your World of Darkness character into a true monster in all of these games. And this is might be the, 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 one of the original intentions of the game, and therefore the absolutely truest way of playing. If you read Mark and Hagen's essay in first edition, it's also copied in the second edition, it says that we play monsters to learn where our own personal moral boundaries are. By transgressing them, we learn what is right and what is wrong. And we cannot do that without massacring innocent school children with Molotov cocktails. That is apparent, isn't it? The, the thrill of having a gaming group that trusts each other so much that they can pull out all the stops and play the crazy Sabbat characters and trump each other with more and more terrifying stuff until somebody vomits around the gaming table <laughs> or just plain leaves is apparently the intended one true way of playing World of Darkness. I mean, it's World of Darkness. Darkness, not fluffy puppies, not slight dimness. One true way, playing World of Darkness. But that completely misses the point. The World of Darkness is the epic description of human history seized, seen through the eyes of outsiders. Tabletop role playing specifically gives us the opportunity to follow characters of a vast amounts of time. And vampires can do it, mages can travel in time. There is even now a werewolf supplement called Shattered Dreams, where we go back to the very origins of uh, the, the War of Rage and can fight against Dinosaurs, <laughs> written by, <laughs> by uh, <laughs> were alligators. <laughs> this is serious. Uh, <clears throat> the historical chronicle can be played in many different ways. There's the very straight-faced Giovanni Chronicles. There's the just having the fate of a vampire go from their origins into now is an exercise in, what, uh, in a field of history called mental history. Barbara Tuckman's A Distant Mirror is one of my own personal favorites. 
that follows uh, how has the human morality and, and humanity's view on social subjects, on good and evil, and so on, changed during time. And these kinds of chronicles allow us to live through that grand scope and see how a character, an individual person, travels from a world where God is absolutely real and the feudal system is absolute and true into our postmodern world with gender ne renegotiations and so on. And that's a beautiful thing to see our place in the vast scope of history. World of Darkness has introduced so many people to historical periods with their Dark Ages supplements, uh, and the other, the Sorcerer's Crusade, uh, which is really about the, the Enlightenment or the beginnings of science. All of these things are valuable lessons. We also learn that you can mount a crystal-based laser gun on the back of a triceratops. Um, so apparently it's the one true way of experiencing the full depth and scope of the world of darkness. But you need to move around and understand and connect points and see new things in order to understand the world of darkness. All of the other examples I've taken here, most of them are single game ideas. They are things that are based around being a vampire or being a werewolf, but that is not the one true way of playing world of darkness because it's world of darkness, okay? not different worlds of darkness. It's one thing, and it has all this grandeur, meaning that a vampire must re-examine their position as manipulator in the world when they encounter the technocracy for the first time. They must see that their position as the top predator might not be true, and that their view of the world as being a Judeo-Christian construct where God has cursed Cain and so on might not be the whole picture because there is a mother there, a weaver that has created the world and that now desires their destruction because they are a blight upon the world. The first time a vampire learns about their position in the werewolf's mythology is heartbreaking and very, very interesting. This teaches us that we never know everything. Our view of the world is not necessarily true. And also just the wonder of exploring all of these 850 books that each contain myriads of characters, myriads of concepts, and just yeah, daring you to go out there and explore. Um, these chronicles can be, uh, can be global. Uh, they can be when these other worlds come to you in your town, um, in your city. But that essence, the crossover chronicle, is when you understand what the world of darkness really is because it contrasts the different creatures from each other. Absolutely the one true way. But I don't think you're reading it quite properly there because I think there is stronger support for the werewolf cosmology actually being true than the, uh, the mage one. Could Gaia just be created by belief? Or is there a pre-existence in the Trinity? And what does it mean? What does it all mean? Because there is a hidden meaning built into World of Darkness. And unveiling that meaning, written in by the authors, is the absolute true way of playing World of Darkness. Decipher it. Find how the meta plot works. Find out the contradictions. Find which voice of all the people who are telling us about the world of darkness, which one is the truth? What is the most true interpretation? This is a way that, can, that, that I think that both, um, both Indiana Jones-like adventures, or Indiana Beckett, perhaps I should say, <laughs> noddest adventures, where you try to figure out what is really, really true in vampire mythology, or werewolf mythology and so on, that nodist perspective of exploring unknown temples, finding new clues to what is actually going on, and whether Gehenna is around the corner. That, I mean, truth is in there. This is the true way of playing it, because it searches for truth. And it 
it says that there is not just subjective game design here, but there is a grand vision and description of a cosmology. The cosmologist's choice, the most sophisticated physicists of the world of darkness enjoy, not disunited, the truth is out there, the one literally true way of playing world of darkness. But no. It's in the eyes of babies that you see the real truth. It's the first time you encounter the world of darkness that, that is at its most potent. As a completely unknowing human being who has lived, lived your entire life in this safe world, the first time that crackling ghost voice appears on the tape, that first time the ghoul lifts you above the floor in a feat of strength that is impossible. That moment when this, the illusions break and reality reveals itself for what it is, that has to be the one true way of playing World of Darkness. The first uh, playing more kitchen sink-like campaigns where you play ordinary mortals who slowly, slowly realize that the, the world they live in is not the ordinary one. Or vampires who slowly realize that they are being manipulated by forces vastly outside of their control. That stomach-dropping moment when everything you thought was true is shattered. That's the absolutely true way of playing World of Darkness. Innocence confronting the truth. Tourists that touch the World of Darkness. This is where we see it as its truest. Because when we look at World of Darkness and read all the books, read through all of them, we know everything, we know every single creature, there's no one in the real world that experiences the world like that. Everyone experiences it as an innocent moving into it. And that's the innocence we have to regain in order to be able to play World of Darkness in the one true way. Mm, not quite. What about the Renfields, the ghouls, the kinfolks, all of these people around the supernatural creatures? Aren't those the ones that knows their degenerate rock stars that they're minding or the uh, eco-terrorists that they are protecting? Isn't the perspective of the slight outsider, the ghoul and so on, isn't that the truth? The day men who fix the business of the vampires who see the interface between the real world and the world of darkness. Those that stand firmly with one foot in each world and are able to be wiser for it and maybe, just maybe, find that move to make them rise from the very lowest rung of the ladder and climbing upwards. That is, of course, the most sustainable campaign and the, the truest way of playing World of Darkness, except for the luchadores of the night! <laughs> Or the ashtray that is Samuel Haight. Or the in-game descriptions of Black Dog. I mean, come on, this is the company that did the Street Fighter game. And these things are in there. The comedy gold is solidly supported by a lot of the modules. About five, six years into the run, this thing started popping up with an alarming consistency. There's a lot of good humor in there. And you know, if you take World of Darkness too seriously, are you really playing it right? Come on, they have a version of Marilyn Manson in there. They have, uh, you have versions of all themselves. Uh, like the classic White Wolf crew are all represented um, in their fictitious black dog game factory. The Fomoris are hilarious uh, and disgusting. Uh, Mr. Twinkle, the, the paradox spirit, anyone? Who appears and deletes your life. Uh, it's a pretty funny guy. And we should also remember that there was even a there was a, even a fighting game based on World of Darkness. It was a reskin of a Japanese fighting game, but they created a cabinet for it and so on. So these gonzo crazinesses 
which I think is, um, is held together by, oh, I can't remember his name now, what is he? The Avengerverde something. A, there's a, a, um, a vampire luchadora who meets creature after creature in the ring in the Sabat fighting pits of, uh, of Mexico, I believe. He is the one who gets to see the most number of enemies in the world of darkness. And he gets to laugh at them. Because they are kind of stupid, you know. And if you don't really have this distance and this laughter, and if you can't appreciate the irony of Samuel Haight being an ashtray in, um, uh, in Stygia, then you're not really playing World of Darkness. Comedy is the true one way of playing World of Darkness. No. It is actually doing your own thing. Taking the basis of the world of darkness and making sure that it's possible for people who know it a lot to still play it and still appreciate it. To do your personal hack, a custom setting, avoiding all the baggage of metaplot, rules that everybody knows, this is the right way of playing it. Take the good bits and make them yours and turn it into a different thing that is almost like World of Darkness, but not quite, but it's yours. This um, heretical readings of World of Darkness, we've seen them a lot, vampire games that are vampire games, but not Vampire the Masquerade. This might still have clans, they might still have the concept of humanity and so on, but it's not the Ventru and the, and the Malkavians and so on we meet, but it's that creator's custom Creatures may be based on, on Finnish folklore or based on the idea of scientific vampires that are created by science, but still retaining the world of darkness, unique position of being set in the real world with um, other readings. There might even be fantasy worlds uh, for world of darkness. Take the best parts, make it your own. That is apparently the one true way of playing World of Darkness. You probably got it by now. I don't know. You might not. But yeah, I'm sorry. But that doesn't really solve our design problem that we are now facing uh, when we want World of Darkness to become something that spreads far, far outside of this room that spreads far, far outside tabletop gaming, live action gaming, even far outside of computer games. When you start to create something that is known as like a proper fiction universe, comparable to say, Star Wars or the Marvel Universe and so on, there are a number of hard decisions to make. Because all of these things are a part of the legacy of World of Darkness, we all know this. But the HBO show cannot simultaneously have the luchadores and the trench coats and katanas and the Ode Beast within. It will be very, very, very hard sell to do that. And it probably is going to be a very split up schizophrenic TV show. Of course, the World of Darkness is a huge place uh, and it can cover a lot of ground. But as a transmedial universe, the world of darkness needs to find a more unified style and tone. So it works something like this. At the core, we have the setting. Outside that, we have expressions in different media, in tabletops, in movies, in computer games, in card games, in LARPs. And across that runs a meta plot that unites the whole thing. And the way that I approach this and think about this is that every single medium has a slight tonal shift and has a slight, is more suited for one of these ways of playing. So even if you have an overarching style, look, feel, you can reflect these traditions in the different expressions of the world. That's my hope and it's uh, the challenge that we have set before ourselves to do. But first, we have to go to the core. When I go to a computer games developer and they ask me, what's the world of darkness? It's like, 
I can't hand him an 850 page book. I cannot explain all of these things and still keep his interest. There must be a vision that is tight, unified, and compelling. So we, uh, I tried to create some goal posts that we at least, at least need to hit in order for this to feel like a world of darkness, like to feel like a one world of darkness. The first pillar that I talk about is that this is a different power fantasy. Most, uh, most fiction franchises, especially in the computer games field, is about leveling up, becoming stronger, having bigger shoulder pads, larger caliber of your gun, and just becoming more and more and more badass over time. This is, this is not true in World of Darkness. A VIP pass to the right party, the right dress, and the right comment can be just as powerful as a bolt gun in the World of Darkness. This is a different power fantasy. It is not totally reliant on the classic becoming the man. Here are heroes that have better use of social skills, of social manipulation, of uh, being able to assert their power in other ways. This is a game that speaks to other dreams of power, I think. Of course, it's like it does include violence and all that, but not exclusively and not to the extent that every other brand does. It's co-created, meaning it has many authors and it's for many media. This has always been true. The tabletop game was just the first thing. It very quickly was followed by novels, by uh, LARP, even computer games, action figures. The Theo Bell action figure is awesome. Uh, and that is where we're moving again. In the 90s, this was a transmedia franchise. So it has that in its core. This is not something you plaster on top of something. It is at its absolutely core to be a thing that exists in multiple media. And it's more than violence. It has violence, sure, that is implied in more than, because it also includes violence. Uh, but it has, it has mage with a magic system that blows everybody's mind when they hear about it. It has, uh, it has social mechanics in each and every type of supernatural that is as complex as a combat system is in another game. This is a game that has so much more. And it is set in our real world and touches upon some terrifying subjects. This is a brave world. This is a world that dares to approach uh, unspeakable acts to talk about heart-wrenching consequences inside our own, our own world. So in brief, I present it as a collective work of horror fiction with protagonists that balance on the moral edge between monster and hero, a critical, dark vision of our world where the creatures of gothic horror live among us, a fearless fiction, a global fiction by diverse voices, and an original transmedia universe expressed with different focus in different formats. But also a unified art design making visual media like video games and TV possible. And this is the last, and this is the, the last of the aesthetics. And it is the one that the One World of Darkness will use because of obvious reasons. It's that monsters are real and you are one of them. At the end, if you boil down all of these other play styles, you will be left with, it is set in a world very much like our own, and you play monsters. There is a second reason for going for this realistic interpretation of the world of darkness. And that is, of course, the nature of TV and video games and so on. Let me show you a little bit what happens when you apply this philosophy to a classic world of darkness franchise. This is Werewolf the Apocalypse. Uh, so this is the traditional way that we see werewolf depicted. 
It is, uh, it's anime inspired, it's brutal, it's muscular, but it also wears quite a lot all over the place, you know. It has illustrators ranging from the very intricate and uh, decorative to simplistic comic book illustrations. But in general, it has an anime comic book feel. What happens when you transpose the struggle of the Garu against the worm into our world? What would be the, the aesthetics? The aesthetics of resistance. These are real subjects. The world is dying in a fever. Gaia is on her last leg, and we all know this. And the werewolves, they know that we know, and yet we do nothing. The werewolves were inspired by the ideology of groups like Earth First. The worm is a direct comment on global warming. When you take these aesthetics and take them seriously, you end up with something that has the rage, the fury, and the righteous anger of werewolf, but looks and feels scary. A silent strider and a uh, wendigo, perhaps, early sketches for designs of a computer game, of a computer game version of the Krynos. Moving away from the huge muscular bodybuilder with the dog's head on top means that we can work more with body position, make something that feels like it is a killing machine from nature, from Gaia. And these are the, kind, these are the kinds of results you get when you take the old art design and run it through the polished process of making it real. How would these monsters anatomically work? How would they... Uh, like how would they appear if they were real? And that is, is an, is, becomes a, a, such a strong vision that I believe that it's, it can work perfectly fine as a movie or as a computer game. These are the vistas that are in the future of the World of Darkness. Uh, detailed, hyper-real, believable, but without losing a single beat in the metaplot. We honor everything that has happened. We have read them as comic books, as legends, and so on. But you know what? Those events were real. There were real, wol real wolves out there dying for this. And in the future, we might be able to see their real faces. And the struggle for Gaia will not end until the last tree is cut and the last wolf is dead. So, to summarize, role-playing has as many flavors as gaming groups. A video game or a TV show has mostly one. To be able to handle all of this multiplicity of traditions and legacies, the choice we have made is going for a world of darkness that feels real and that looks real and that does not have the um, Tim Burton-esque filter of eternal gargoyles and eternal rain, that does not have the anime flavor uh, of werewolf or the technocolor um, the outrageousness of some of the technocracy stuff. All of these things you can give to an art designer and say, capture that emotion, but make it real. So this is the transition that we're making. And we're not doing this to break with tradition or to, uh, to uh, disrespect the long legacy of different ways to play. We're doing this to show our favorite universe to the whole world. This is the first world that unites werewolves, vampires, and so on. It is before, so like before Twilight was a twinkle in Stephanie Meyer's eyes, she was, she was vampire LARPing. Charlene Harris was a storyteller for Vampire the Masquerade. It's time for us and our world to be known as the one true world of darkness. And that, I think, is the one true way to play this. By showing the world what we have and inviting them into our, uh, into our beautiful uh, quarter century legacy. To begin with, we might visit the very core values 
uh, the very core ideas, a little bit like Doctor Who, when Doctor Who relaunched, was about a man in a box and his companion. But in the second season, of course, we have the Daleks taking more the front stage and so on. Imagine a similar thing here. We go for the core values, for the core aesthetics first, and then, oh boy, do we have material for a couple of seasons? Oh yes, we do. So, um, the World of Darkness is a huge setting, and it can be pressed in, in many media, so different tones are possible. But the main one, realism, will carry it through uh, to the mainstream. How about tabletop games? How about supporting these different methods of play? Beyond the apparent uh, thing that we will use photography as a very, very strong aspect in the next edition of Vampire, at least, uh, to capture how these creatures actually look. Um, we have Mary, tw uh, Mary Lee Twisted Lamb, who is uh, one of the, uh, my very favorite uh, fashion designers and art directors taking charge of Vampire. And I think it's a logical choice taking somebody from the actual high fashion world to take charge of Vampire the Masquerade's aesthetic. Because she has a wonderful taste. She worked for the MMO as well. But yes, um, furthermore, how will these things be? Can you play in, in these different ways in Vampire the Masquerade, in the next edition, for instance? Well, the main developer that we have right now for our game is Kenneth Height. How many are familiar with Trail of Cthulhu or Knight's Black Agents or any one of the other uh, sort of games he has touched? For all of you who do, you know this, but for others, here is how he tends to do things. When he created Trail of Cthulhu, which is a version of, uh, of Cthulhu, he created many different modes of play. Uh, so the purist, the pulp version, and so on. This is for Knight, Knight's Black Agents, his um, vampire agent thriller. So for instance, there is the burn uh, way of playing the game, which focuses on psychological challenges of being an agent. It's, um, uh, yeah, it's um, uh, things like, yes, the Bourne trilogy and uh, alias and so on. What happens to your relationships when you have covers and so on? And there's a specific set of modified rules for playing in that style. Dust is the hyper-realistic setting. It's like, okay, I want to play Tinker Tailor, Soldier, Spy, not Bourne. Okay, this is going to be hyper real, it's going to be boring, and it's going to be very, very easy to die. Then you go dust. That's trying to do as realistic and as humanely possible. Mirror, if you like things like Mission Impossible or yeah, games within games, mind games, that's the style for you. Or stakes, if you like the big, big stakes, if you want to go James Bond and blow out the, the ceiling, that's your style. This is how Ken Height tends to write role-playing games. And I think I would have to actively stop him from doing this with Vampire in order to prevent this from happening. In the final analysis, is this a good idea? To support different traditional play styles uh, within Vampire the Masquerade, for instance? Do you think it's a good idea? Cool, good. We're not completely crazy then. Because just that realization that these games have these vast different ways of being played, the tabletop game has to remain true to that. No matter how polished or perfect a one world of darkness we create, there needs to be room for the katanas. Otherwise, it's not vampire. There needs to be space for all of these different ways, the anxiety, the superheroism, the deep dig into the mystery, all of these things need to be supported by the tabletop role-playing game. And in addition to that, we're launching the Storyteller's Vault, where you or anybody else can write for any edition of any of these games. So all of the old rule systems will be continued to be supported, even if the fifth edition, I think, 
will be pretty nice because it's a modernization of the very ancient storyteller system. But if you like it just the way it is, and that you think it's heresy to introduce a fixed difficulty number on the dice pools, for instance, this will always exist. All editions for all time. And yours to build. 50% of profits will be kept by you. And you can create as many of these as you want. The, the, there will be art styles, style shy sheets, lots of art resources to use, and so on. So yeah, thank you very much for exploring uh, the uh, world of darkness in all its magnificent, crazy shades of gray. And uh, yeah, I think we are just at the 43 minute mark, which is perfect. So thank you very much uh, for listening. And thank you very much for uh, nodding and affirming that I'm not completely crazy. And that I think that someone at least recognized every single style of play. So, and thank you a lot also to the people who have told me about these different styles of play and their experiences of them and how they are the one true way. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? No. No, okay, one question, two questions, two questions. Anyone? You can ask me absolutely anything about World of Darkness. Yeah. Okay, so my question is that I've played quite a lot of these uh, different games of World of Darkness, and uh, the main question I have is how on, <laughs> how, uh, is it possible that humans are still the top dogs of this universe? Yeah. <clears throat> what if after 9-11, uh, somewhere around there, the, when uh, Homeland Security is created and the NSA are given absolute rights to surveil every single phone in, uh, in America, in a world where they can store all data traffic on planet Earth for a month and go through it, how hard is it for vampires to hide them? Exceptionally hard. Uh, in fact, this is something that we're directly dealing with because you're asking a realist question and I love those. Because the, the obvious answer is that because it's the world of darkness, it needs to work like that. But that's not satisfy, it doesn't satisfy me at all. Rather, I like to talk to my friends from FRA, the Swedish representative of NSA, and say like, look, how would vampires be able to hide in this world? And they go like, okay, they need to do this. They need to start acting like drug dealers, and they need to have like burner phones, and they need to never, they, they need to have never be on Facebook, and so on. And then I go, okay, I'm putting that in the setting. Vampires are disengaging from digital media because they would die if they were there. Logic. Also, you know what? When you can't call up Vienna on a cell phone, shit gets real and it gets maybe a little bit more exciting because the, 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 the problem of communicating between cities becomes a real thing when there's surveillance, when NSA could listen in. So in the setting, some people within the NSA know, but who is above them? who has created this system? Why is it impossible for even, for, uh, even for Tremer on the path of technology manipulation to do this? Technocracy, of course. Makes perfect sense. Are the technocracy a part of, hu of hum the human culture or the human world? It's a borderline case. I would say that our institutions and so on are empowered sometimes by things like the technocrats, who have a vested interest in protecting the status quo around that specific thing. So I say, maybe they're not completely hidden. Maybe, they, I mean, there's not, not every single human being is ignorant. Some people are just shutting up about it because they're paid off uh, by the vampires, or because they know that the world will be thrown into chaos if people know this and they will try to make profits out of it and so on. And this is the great thing of having people like Ken Haidt working with this. He's a master 
at making plausible connections between uh, international spy games and, and, um, uh, and vampires and the supernatural. And we want to do the same thing with like, how do mages work within academia? Then I would go to like, okay, let me go to like a couple of professors and lectors and say like, how would this work? How would the technocracy be embedded within uh, cognition science, say? Uh, and so on. That's the realist reading, and it's the perfect question. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Thank you very much. It's a wrap, and we blood and souls, and see you in the darkness. <laughs>